people I think the normal today maybe because the weather's a little bit cold maybe because there's a lot to do at the end of the semester uh, maybe because people are rushing on their course projects um, if you have not yet started the survey of course it's um, optional but this just goes right to um, the program on campus which facilitated our course project um, the connection with UNICEF the data all of this and so there this is the first time they've done this um, as, uh, as was said, so if you can give some feedback, that's very, very helpful. So please, if you're able and willing and have a little time, please do this. Uh, fill out the survey, give them a little feedback. Um, I just want to point out, so of course the, um, oh, just a comment here. If you, um, uh, if, if you don't get to this like right now, um, there's a link here you can, click, you can click and you can do this later. There'll be another announcement that goes out for that. But I'm back here at the announcements because I just want to scroll down and remind you, of course you know that we have our own course project presentations. So every, every detail that is currently finalized is in uh, this Quirkus announcement. So if you, if you are still having, if you haven't seen this and you have questions about the course project, start here. If you have seen this and you still have questions about the course project, we just haven't quite finalized the details yet, but in my view, the explanation here is sufficient for what the format is kind of going to be. It's only a question of like the logistics of like when to arrive and how you check in and things like that. But I'm actually, I have an 1130 meeting today to finalize that. So we'll finalize this soon. For now, you're working on your course project, you're getting your slides together, and you're ready for the instructions for how you'll finally present. Um, so that's an, an announcement there, and uh, that's one that I sent out, but also you'll remember uh, this announcement and potentially a couple other announcements as well, um, and specifically also on Thursday at a slightly different time, so your presentation slot would be 9 to 11. Um, if for some reason your group members can't make it, we can move you to the 1 to 3 presentation slot, but your whole team needs to let me know. Everybody needs to be on the email, everybody needs to reply and confirm, so it's not that one group member is changing the time out underneath from everybody else. Uh, but probably you're presenting at 9 to 11, I think that would be the majority of teams. Um, but from 10 to 12, which is actually quite convenient, because you could give your presentations and then you could go to this 10 to 12 thing, are the, the showcase presentations. So this project, this relationship with UNICEF, this data, this effort, as you know, because you'll remember uh, when we had Evan Wheeler from UNICEF come in and describe this project, you'll know there's an effort happening across uh, multiple classes. And so if you're interested in seeing more broadly different perspectives and different efforts on this project, um, then this is what the showcase presentations are for. And then of course, remember that we're selecting three teams that have put kind of special effort into this to represent our class. Our class has 100 project groups. That's different than the other courses, uh, which have a more limited, a smaller number of students and then a more focused kind of approach to the presentation. So we can only select a few, but we want to select a few great presentations, do a good job representing our class. Um, and uh, this is, like I think, a very nice honor and, and an award and a recognition. The kind of thing, you'll, you'll be talking about this project in interviews, in the way you present yourself, your experience, and so on. And so additionally, if you're one of the teams that gets selected to actually present, then basically you can say, our project, our team won a project prize. We were three out of 99 teams that actually did the special presentation. So that's a big deal for the, for the teams that get selected for this. This is, I think, a, a, a fun little perk, an extra of this project. But for everybody else, we'd love for you to attend and kind of like support our group presentations in our class, that's fine. Also see what the other projects are like, that's interesting. Maybe it's interesting to meet different people who have some familiarity on this project that you yourself have. So potentially you could go, you could ask questions, maybe meet someone interesting, that could be kind of fun too. Um, and then um, as is kind of detailed in what I've highlighted here, um, this doesn't count for a mentorship one-on-one -on -one thing, but there's the three points in the STA 130 mentorship program. 
and one of them is social and one of them is career oriented, and this could count for either of these. So you would tend, uh, I don't know, maybe 30 minutes to an hour or something like this, and then write your reflection about your experience of seeing uh, these presentations. And maybe one more thing, uh, I, I said we would wait, but I'll, I'll go ahead and comment. Okay. Um, would you, do you know much uh, about Terry from UNICEF? Um, I, I don't because it's just been announced very recently that, yeah, Terry Worthington Combs is from, we just found out from the Toronto UNICEF office and is coming to watch the presentations at the showcase. Uh, and so I think it's a great opportunity to see the work that you've done in action and in context. So whether or not you're actually presenting, you know, if it is the kind of thing that you want to talk about on future resumes or interviews, whether or not you are presenting that day, to be able to see the, how the work that you've done connects to a more interna international context and connects to ethical issues uh, and, you know, could give you some talking points in maybe a job interview or to put on a resume. So I think, and it's just really exciting to get to be at an event where someone from the UN is actually there to kind of see all this student hard work. So, yeah, it's a little kind of, pitch. Kind of a big deal. Like, yeah. it's coming together really well. We're very yeah. excited that she's visiting. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, I think, I think then, if you haven't yet been able to um, finish this survey, um, we'll be sending out an announcement again, but we, we certainly want your feedback on this. Um, and once again, this is not any feedback. It's not, like, related to the survey of the course. It's not any feedback that goes to me necessarily, but of course I collaborate uh, with the office and so the work that you guys do is informed by this and yes. et cetera, et cetera. Thank so we, you. we'd like for you to be able to provide feedback if you can. Um, awesome. With that, yep. yeah, Thank we'll you so much. move on to next festivity. majors that were more accessible across the university. We happen to sit down and have a sandwich together. All right. Okay, this is what you what? Great, thanks. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, and sorry, you're gonna you're gonna be tied in here. Uh, let's move it all the yeah. way over. Um, and it was fun talking to Steve. Uh, it's always fun talking to someone who's interested in data science. And I hadn't really, I don't know too many philosophers to be honest with you. Um, and Steve was talking about the work that he does to create ethics content, he calls them ethics modules, and then we take them into like a lot of computer science classes and they're increasingly in a lot of statistics classes. And Steve told me, he's like, oh yeah, yeah, we could do something about like classification, maybe we could talk about distribution matrices. And I was thinking, oh, we already do all of this in class. But then I saw Steve's content and what he was actually doing, and I think it's really, really interesting. I think it makes classification and prediction in a machine learning, predictive modeling context a lot more interesting than I thought it was, um, honestly. So I'm extremely pleased to have Steve here. He'll talk to us for, I don't know, 40, 50 minutes, yeah. something along these lines. Take it away, Steve. Okay. Oh, sorry, one more thing. Uh, we have worksheets. I got worksheets to most people, but would you please raise your hand if you don't have a worksheet? And then I'll, I'll try not to be interruptive, but make sure that whoever doesn't have one gets a worksheet. Okay, thanks so much. So welcome, everybody. So like your instructor said, I'm Steve Coyne. Um, I work with the Embedded Ethics Program. And so we found a way, um, you, you, so in this course, you're learning kind of at the end of, of, of your process, becoming, like, becoming acquainted with you know, the practical aspects of programming in statistics. Um, you've been learning how to create classifiers. And classifiers are a place in statistics where already you can run into lots of ethical problems. Um, so you'll need a little bit of sort of technical vocabulary to understand those um, problems, um, but also we'll, we'll, we'll equip you with some of the ethical concepts you need to deal with them. So as you've seen kind of in your, in your tutorials last week, which also incorporated some ethical elements, you know, a classifier is basically just something that takes some input data, applies an algorithm to it, and then it makes some classification or decision based upon it. So the, um, if you were in tutorial last week, you, know, you, looked at, you, you dealt with a few different um, concrete examples of classifiers. So towards the end, one of the ones you considered was this medical um, admissions classifier. 
So you know, a classifier takes a whole bunch of data and you know performs um, math on it to try and figure um, performs math on it to try and mimic some training data as much as possible and generate a classification based upon that. So the medical admissions classifier you looked at, you know. Um, that you contemplated um, could take a whole bunch of different in, um, elements about applicants into account. So that it could take into account their income, their net worth, um, their undergraduate GPA, their profession, their criminal history, their marriage status, their age. And what we asked you to do in tutorial was walk through um, which of those elements you thought were appropriate to take into account. So some probably struck you as pretty clear cut, right? Like, um, I wasn't there for your tutorial, so you know, if you wound up reaching different conclusions, uh, let me know. Um, but I did talk with many of your TAs. And of course, it seems like if you're trying to figure out, um, I assume many of you maybe do want to apply to medical school someday. So it seems like a, a classifier system that, took, that was trying to classify who should be admitted to medical school um, based upon, say, previous data, should definitely take into account undergraduate GPA. You know, there's no controversy there. And maybe profession, too, is pretty clear-cut, right? Like, profession's going to be very relevant to whether someone's going to be a good doctor or not. But then, a little much more iffy, you probably found some reasons to think that income and net worth weren't appropriate things to take into account. And there's a couple different ways that you could um, capture that. You know, one was simply by thinking about the harms and benefits to the different stakeholders involved. You know, when you think about the prospective medical applicants, you know, it seems like some of them are going to be maybe unfairly treated if you, if you use, say, low income as a reason not to, admit someone to, um, not to admit someone to medical school. You might even see that their rights are violated. Um, you could also take into account the impacts on society as a whole. You know, maybe society as a whole benefits from having um, doctors that come from a wide range of income classes. The ones that seemed probably most iffy to you, though, were ones about like marriage status and age, but especially marriage status. Like whether someone is like single or a ba uh, married or, or whatever seems extremely irrelevant to whether they should be a doctor, right? But notice that all this information, if you, train, if you um, fed it into a machine learning algorithm, like the ones that you've been using for, would probably generate better, better predictions. Um, but nevertheless, even though they would probably generate better predictions, there seem to be some pretty strong reasons not to take, them, not to take some of this information into account. OK, so that's what you talked about in tutorials last week. You know, you did some technical stuff about classifiers and then started thinking about which kinds of information you should bring into your classifiers. But what we're going to do today is add a further nuance to this. You know, everything that you talked about um, in tutorial sort of has to do with how a classifier treats a particular person. But there's going to be a new set of problems that come out when we ask, how com when we compare how classifiers treat different individuals. So if a classifier, say, treats a person, um, treats two different people in different ways, that's going to raise a new host of issues. And we're going to need to get a little more technical in order to understand these issues appropriately. So to begin with, let's go back in time. We'll, we'll think about, say, um, a hiring algorithm. So machine learning wasn't really a thing 50 years ago, but you could imagine if you were to try and create an algorithm um, that reflected how people actually made hiring decisions 50 years ago, it would probably include gender as an explicit variable, right? Like quite often, women were explicitly excluded from, algorithm, from um, hiring decisions simply because they were women. Now, I want, to so, I want to emphasize, so that's one obvious way in which an algorithm can treat different people unfairly, right? If it, say, treats, if it, say, takes gender as a variable and explicitly excludes women on the basis of being women. So very clear-cut unfair, right? I do want to emphasize, though, that we don't necessarily want to say, especially not yet, that any algorithm that takes gender into account is automatically unfair. But all we're saying at this point is that there are at least some cases where taking gender into account as an explicit variable would be pretty unfair. 
So here's, that's, that's the easy case, right? If you go back in time 50 years ago and think about how a machine learning algorithm would mimic the, uh, the, the decision making they made back then, um, pretty clearly unfair. But here's a harder case taken from the present day. So how many of you drive a car? Not that many, okay. I drive a car. Okay, your instructor drives a car. Um, how many of you are from like the suburbs? Like, you know, Brampton, Mississauga. Now, did you know in Mississauga, especially Brampton, insurance, car insurance prices are substantially higher? Okay. Now, many, when this came up, you know, many people obviously linked it to, um, you know, the, the increased proportion of, of, um, of of new Canadians, immigrant Canadians, and racialized people in the suburbs. And they say, well, this is kind of unfair, right? You know, we've got Brampton, which has many fewer white Canadians than, say, downtown. They have higher car insurance prices. And it seems to be, you know, that, that difference seems to tell us something about the fairness of the algorithm. But, you know, this one definitely should seem like a little bit of a harder case than the, than the, than the previous algorithm, right? So let me ask you a question, and I hope someone will respond. What further kinds of questions would you want to ask about this Brampton case to figure out whether you think the algorithm's fair or unfair? Yeah? Okay, so good. That's one thing we would want to know, that if there are higher car accidents, car accidents say in the suburbs, you know, that's going to dramatically decrease our, our, our sense that it's unfair. Although it still might not settle it. Anything else come to mind? Yeah. How many people own cars? Okay, how many people own cars? You know, if there's few cars or many cars, maybe that makes a difference. Good. Okay. Good. So you're starting to think, that, you know, so a classifier here, the insurance classifier, um, generates a prediction of presumably how likely someone's to get into an accident. But here it seems to lead to a differential treatment. It treats, um, say, people in the suburbs differently than it treats people downtown. Okay. So the example we're going to focus on in the worksheet is an even more controversial algorithm. So this is an algorithm that's used to, used to predict um, it's, it's an algorithm in the criminal justice system, and it's used to predict something called recidivism. And this is a word you're going to get to know. You probably haven't heard of, but you're going to get to know a lot in the next 20 minutes. Recidivism is whether someone is likely to commit another criminal offense. So if someone's already committed a criminal offense, to, reci uh, to recidivate is, is for them to commit another criminal offense after. So typically, you know, we want to, if, if, if you're in the criminal justice system, there are many cases where you'll want to determine whether someone's committed, is going to commit another offense. So if they've just been arrested, for example, you know, you'll want to ask, um, well, should I let them out on bail or should I keep them in jail? And you'll want to know, are they likely to recidivate? Um, if they already have been in jail and you're trying to figure out whether you should let them out on parole, you're definitely going to want to know in that case whether they're likely to recidivate. You know, if they're going to recidivate, you'll probably want to keep them in jail. If you don't think they're going to recidivate, you might feel okay releasing them back into the public before their sentence is done. And so Compass is a famous example of a recidivism classification algorithm. It's actually, it's, so it's used in many places in the United States. It's created by a private company. And so many states, many um, um, state and city justice systems have used it as part of figuring out um, who should be released and who shouldn't be released. And so what Compass does basically then, thinking about it as a classification algorithm, which is exactly what it is, is it takes a bunch of input applicants or input data about, um, about uh, someone who has committed a criminal offense. So you look first and foremost at their criminal history, you know, the kinds of offenses they've done, the number of offenses they've done. Um, but you'll take other things into account, like their age and gender and so forth. And then we sort of train it on, on a bunch of predictions, and then it spits out a decision of whether the person is high risk, to, high risk to commit another offense or low risk to commit another offense. 
Okay, so what you should have in front of you then is a handout which features the confusion, a sample confusion table used in the case of Compass. So there's some questions, um, and what you'll see is Compass works differently for two different social groups, two different demographic groups. You know? So you'll see social group number one and social group number two. So we've got, what these questions are designed to do is to ask you to sort of think through how these two groups are being treated differently. And um, so what I'd like you to do is just complete questions one through eight, um, just individually for the next, we'll say, eight minutes. And then we'll come back and discuss the, question, the answers as a big group before moving on to question number nine. So just do questions one through eight for the next, um, say, eight minutes. So we'll come back at 9.39 to talk about, to take up the answers. You may need a calculator at the very end.
OK, just one more minute. How many people are finished all eight questions? Maybe I should ask before we go on. OK. We'll give it, actually, let's give it two more minutes. OK, so let's bring it back to a big group. So just to make sure we're all on the same page before we um, ask the fairness question about these classifiers, uh, let's make sure we've got a good understanding of the, of the basic math that's involved. So you know, the very first question on the, on the handout asked you, you know, what are the actual rates of recidivism for a social group A and social group B? So here you just have to add the columns down. So social group A, it's going to be 66. Um, so 66 out of 100 actually recidivate. Whereas for social group B, it's only 16 plus 22, so 38, um, 38 people recidivate. So social group A, in general, is, is more likely to recidivate than social group B. And that's going to matter as we, go, as we go forward. So then the second question, the, the, the next sort of questions, we're asking you about which, which percentages of each group were predicted to recidivate. And so you can see here, this also varies from group to group. So group A was very likely to recidivate, they were, or they were predicted to be very likely to recidivate. So 80 out of 100 of them were, were predicted to recidivate, whereas only 21 out of 100 were predicted to recidivate. And notice if we're talking about, um, say, something like Compass, something that's going to be used to determine whether people should be um, put in jail or released, this means of social group A, 80 of them are going to be put back in jail, and of social group B, only 21 are going to be put back in jail. Okay. So this is what we'll call, this, this criteria, comparing this between two different groups, we'll call demographic parity. So we'll move on to the next question, to the walking through the questions. So the next criteria we'll call equalized odds. So here we're comparing the total proportion of false negatives. And so we can see here that it's 6 versus 22. So it's much higher for this group than it is for this group. Same over here, the other part of equalized odds, you know, 20 for this group, 5 for this group. Okay. So secondly, the, the next set of uh, measures, Q5 and Q6, have to do with what we'll call error rate balance. So here we're not just looking at the raw numbers of false positives and false negatives, but the, the, the false um, positive rate and the false negative rate. So here we have to look, in this case, of um, the total number of people, um, of the ones who actually recidivated, um, how many of them were predicted not to recidivate and how many of them were predicted to recidivate. And so here, the false negative rate 
um, for group A is very, very low. You know, only 10% of people are, are, are only, there's only 10% false negatives here. Whereas here there's 60, almost 60% 60 false negatives. So this is very different between the groups. And when we look at the false positive rate, we get similar kind of differences. You know, for group A, there's a high, high chance of false positives, but for group B, there's a very, very low chance of false positives. Okay. Okay. So the last criteria we asked you to look at wasn't about false positive and false negative, but about the calibration of the different, of, of the classifier. So how well, how strong its predictions were. So if it predicts something, how likely was that prediction to be correct? And that, notice that that is different from false positive and false negative. So in this case, we, the, the, the first thing we asked you to look at was kind of the negative calibration error. So here, when we look at the people who are not predicted to recidivate in each group, you know, so that's 20 in total, here they make errors 6% of the time, or for 6 out of 20, and they're correct 14. Um, 14. So the total error is 30% is here. Whereas here, um, the error is actually pretty similar. So we've got 22 people who, so out of the people who are predicted not to recidivate, we've got 22 who actually do recidivate, so there's 22 errors, but 57 actually don't recidivate. So this is also, the, the negative calibration error is pretty low, is, is pretty much the same here, almost 0.3. And we can say something similar for the positive calibration errors. You know, the positive calibration errors are 0.25 and 0.25. Okay. Yep. Can I ask a question? Sure. If these are close, these probabilities are close, but we're still failing this criteria, right? And we failed all the other measures too, all the other variance measures, or? So the, these criteria, so in terms of equality, the, we, we are succeeding on the equal calibration measure. Close enough. Close, close enough. enough. Yeah. It doesn't have to be, we wouldn't necessarily expect it to be exactly right, but we are pretty close here. So let's, let's sum up quickly like looking at the different measures. So most of the measures treat the groups very differently. So a demographic parity, you know, very different from group to group. Equalized odds, um, pretty different from group to group. Um, false negative rate, pretty different. False positive rate, pretty different. But calibration is, calibration is pretty similar. So bearing that in mind, you know, so what, what I'd like you to do for the next few minutes um, we'll say five minutes with your immediate neighbors, is take your answers to those questions and try to figure out whether you think um, the classifier is fair or not. And if it is fair, if, if it is fair which questions, which um, rates made you think that it was fair? And if, it, if you think it's unfair, which answers to the questions do, kind of drove you to think that it was unfair? So take five minutes in your groups and then we'll come back and talk about it as a big group.
OK, so let's take this up as a big group. So let's, let's sum up where we are again. So we've got this classifier, right? And overall, it has a similar, it, the base rates between, it treats the two groups differently, right? So in general, it's much more likely to treat group A to predict that group A is going to recidivate than group B, right? But at the same time, um, one, at the same time, group A is actually somewhat more likely to recidivate. So 66% 66 of group A actually would recidivate, whereas 38% of group A wouldn't recidivate. So kind of keeping that um, as our backdrop at, at the back of our minds, um, how many people sort of, we'll just do this initially by show of hands. So how many people think that the, that the algorithm is a fair one? Okay, so, some, so definitely some people. And how many people think that the, it's an unfair algorithm, unfair um, classifier? Okay, so slightly more people, but not that many more. So someone who thought that it was fair, what measure kind of makes you, like which of your answers to the questions, or which questions were most determinate in your answer? Like which one kind of led you to the conclusion that it is a fair classifier after all? Thoughts? Yeah, at the front. Okay. So, classic, so the cl the classic, um, sorry, the calibration. So your, your I guess your classmate says the calibration errors between the the two classifiers are identical. You know, each of these classifiers is equally likely to um, to make a to, um, uh, to 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 make an accurate or inaccurate prediction. So, someone who thought that it was unfair, what feature of the algorithm sort of stood out to you? Okay, so it assumes, so equalized odds here, you're saying that it's likely to assume the worst for um, group A, and likely to assume the best for group B. Yeah, that's a nice, that's a nice way of putting it. So here, um, so th th there's obviously a big difference in equalized odds here. So for here, it's um, number six. It's six out of 100. For here, it's 22 out of 100. And so the total proportion of false negatives is different. So this just for each social group, you know, social group B um, uh, is likely to have a lot more uh, false negatives than, group, than social group A. Any other thoughts? What about the false negative rates? Did anyone think that that was kind of the most determinant, um, determinant aspect of the classifier? Yeah. So perfectly well stated. This difference here, you know, is pretty different. So of the members of Group A who actually do recidivate, you know, they almost, um, it's, it's very unlikely to make a false negative for them. But of the ones who actually recidivate in Group B, it's actually, it's reasonably likely to make a false negative. Good. Okay. So just to quickly sum up what these two, um, what the, the two main measures here mean, you know, the difference in false negatives in the calibration. You know, it's worth quickly giving an analogy to a different circumstance. So with false, with, um, say, when false positive or false negative rates differ, you know, what this basically means, so let's, let's use the example, say, of a hiring classifier instead. So what that would mean in a hiring classifier is that if the, so, so suppose that, say, the false positive rate is higher for men than women and the false negative rate is higher for men than women. So, an algorithm that does that in the hiring case 
um, would imply that a qualified woman, so if we're just focusing on the qualified women here, is more likely to be denied a job opportunity, and an unqualified man is, likely, is more likely to be offered a job opportunity. So something analogous is going on with a, a recidivism case between group A and group B, right? But on the other hand, with calibration here, so here's um, a, 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 the kind of analogous job prediction case for the, for the uh, uh, for, uh, for, for the calibration standard. So the same predictions don't mean the same thing for both groups if calibration is out of whack. So suppose you have a classifier that predicts whether a job candidate is likely to succeed in the company. So its prediction, and suppose that its predictions are better calibrated for women than they are for men. So that means that a positive prediction about a female candidate is strong evidence that she'll succeed. So you know, it's likely, it's, um, the, of, the predict, of the predictions, most of them are accurate. But the same prediction about a male candidate is only weak evidence that he'll succeed. So when calibration is out of whack, you know, the, the, kind of, the quality of evidence that the classifier supplies differs between the two, social, between the two groups. Okay, so I, just, I wanna say that this is like a question that doesn't have a clear cut answer. So unlike the first classifier, you know, one that say directly, um, directly discriminates against women, um, or the, even maybe the Brampton case, this one is like especially difficult. People are still debating over whether it's a, a fair algorithm or not. Um, but there's an interesting mathematical result here, and this is like the last technical point that I'm gonna leave you with. But basically what it says is that um, these different fairness criteria cannot all be maximized at the same time, unless, unless there are certain very rare circumstances. So unless the classification is 100% accurate, so there's zero errors, and the base rates are equal between the two groups, we're always going to have to choose between the different fairness criteria. So um, for instance, you can't have error rate balance and equal calibration at the same time. You know, um, if, you, if, if these two conditions aren't satisfied, then if you have 100% error rate balance, then you literally can't have equal calibration. And likewise, the same thing's true for equalized odds and equal calibration. You can't have both at the same time. So you actually do have to, this isn't just a matter of designing a better algorithm. You know, you actually have to, under ordinary circumstances, have to choose which fairness criteria to prioritize. So if that's right, if error rate balance and equal calibration are both necessary for fairness, then does this mean that fair classification is impossible? Thoughts? Or is there some other way we can get fairness? Yeah. Can, can I interrupt that? I, I think it's actually an opportune time because while people can think about what does it mean if you can't satisfy all of these at the same time, it's, it's not that I need both of these to be true <laughs> or the contradiction to, to happen, right? Like it's either one of Right, true, sorry, one of them. Happen. Just either one. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So at least one of, sorry, you're right, one of these has to be true. Either or. One or both. At least one of the following. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess you're talking about fairness in like I don't know if this is exactly what you're applying. Like mm -hmm. in a mathematical sense where it just does not have errors and it predicts everything perfectly fine. Um, then it's probably impossible. <laughs> but like for our application when we say fairness, I think we kind of just mean we minimize errors as much as possible. So in that sense I think it is possible. It's just really hard. Okay, good. So I guess like, um, I, you, so your response sort of tells me that, like, I guess what you said is like, really the obligation to ensure fairness here is one of minimizing errors in general. So to try and get as close as possible to achieving 100% um, accuracy. Because if we did get as close as possible to 100% accuracy, um, we wouldn't have to trade these off as much. That's right. Because we can't alter the fundamental base rates ourselves. Okay. So let me, con let me conclude with um, one more reason why this, might be, um, why this might be relevant both inside and outside the classroom. 
So obviously this is, we might worry when a classifier that does something important treats two groups differently, that it's not just biased in an ordinary sense, but that bias also amounts to discrimination. So discrimination you can define as a distinction, um, whether intentional or not, that's based on grounds relating to personal characteristics of the individual or group, which has the effect of imposing disadvantages on others. So you can see a pretty, at least some argument that something like Compass satisfies this, right? Like something like Compass treats two social groups differently. So in real life, it's racial groups. You know, and the Compass is typically raised in the United States to show the difference between, say, African-American defendants and white defendants. And it imposes a disadvantage that's not imposed upon others. Now, this is actually going to, um, so you can see that that's a, like a law in Canada. It's like a part, it's part of the supreme, it's part of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada that we can't discriminate against people in that way. But it's trickling down into the very laws that govern um, AI work and classification work. So as of at least October 2022, um, the par Parliament's considered legislation that's going to regulate AI. And it has these clauses in it. So first of all, anyone who processes data must take steps to ensure that it's anonymous. So that connects to stuff that you talked about in the tutorial last week. Um, that anyone who's responsible for a high impact system must take steps to identify, assess, and mitigate the risks of harm or biased output. So that means anyone who's responsible for, say, the administration of a classifier that does something important actually has a legal responsibility to make sure that it doesn't lead to either harm to people, like we talked about in tutorial, or biased output, like we talked about today. And so they have a particular definition of biased output in the law. So content that's generated or recommendation or prediction or decision that adversely differentiates in relation to some ground or another, whether it's race or gender or so forth. And here's the kicker. So everyone who commits an offense, so this is actually li likely going to be a criminal offense, is liable to paying a large fine or even imprisonment for up to a, 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 up to a year. So this thing, this, this worry about discrimination, you know, Maybe you're, maybe you're not in a position yet to, do, to deal with classifiers that have this kind of power. But sooner or later, you know, when you go on your internships, when you um, do your startups, you will be confronted with compliance with this law. So you do need to, in, so maybe all of you, if you're looking at, at a classifier for your final project, you should already be thinking, okay, does it perform differently with different groups? And what are the reasons why it would perform differently for different groups? Okay, so thanks so much for having me today. I'll mention that if, you know, this, this way of reasoning that you've done in your tutorial um, or in the lecture today, thinking about different ways of fairness, and there's a bunch of philosophy courses. This is a philosophical way of confronting a problem. And there's also a good literature on technical measures about discrimination. So thank you very much for having me. And I hope to see, you'll like, the, I work again with the Embedded Ethics Program. So if you're teaching more courses, taking more courses in statistics or computer science, um, you'll see more of our modules then. So thank you. Thank you very much, Steve. Um, I think we'll take a little 10 minute break here uh, and then we'll start up again. I've got one more kind of special guest up
Yeah. Um, okay. I was thinking. So like, if the end goal is we want to see what where the models work best, should we not consider predicts because we're more considered about the actual nature of the countries? Like technically, like I feel like your model because it included that, it is more representative of actually predicting probably a prediction error. But if our end goal is not necessarily to predict error best. It's just to find out where, where, in which regions and countries specifically that the models work best. Is it okay if we just omit that? Because then it wouldn't account for that. I think we'll need to talk more. And I know you have a class afterwards. I so I'm not sure when we'd have a chance. It. Yeah, I, let's talk no, after. Because I do have friends, so I'll ask for notes. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's talk after. I think this is a good conversation, but I don't think I can yeah, of course. address I just, it enough I, right I, now. No, it has to be very fast. I'm sorry. Very fast. So my first question is, I made a model and it has the R squared is 5, 2, 6, like this. Hmm, that's is not it, bad. It's, yeah, I, uh, and it's uh, condition number is very low. Amazing. So That's looking promising. And I have made another one where it's 59, it's lower. It's 59, but the condition number is 203, so it's a little too high. Two, but 2K, you said? 203, just 203. I, yeah. So it's a pretty bad. Uh, 59, 59, 59 is uh, like better, but still like not that much better. To, be, that to much. be fair with you. Yeah, I know. I know it's not not better for such an increasing condition. Well, the condition number actually still doesn't concern me that much. Two, 200, 250, I could live with that. that I mean, you're, so you're not wrong. That's a big number, but it's not a crazy big number. What would be a reasonably good R squared? Mm, I can't answer that. I think I think R squared is more characterizing how good the model is in general. But like, what does it mean? I think you're trying to ask me 55 versus 59. I'm not yeah. sure. Because uh, I mean, I'm not you, sure. You, like I mean, for the first model, what I did, I made, I selected like the best categorical variables, the most, the most, the highest uh, correlation ones. For the second one, I also selected the like from all columns. I found like. The top five most correlated uh, columns. I think we have to talk after again. Yeah. I think you can argue this many, many ways. But, but I hope I hope we'll talk yeah, after. Tonight is like <laughs> that's actually pretty. Five percent. And I tried to I tried to sort of estimate the true value of uh, like. You, I, you can argue it both ways. Yeah. No, oh no, Steve forgot this. I have to bring this. I need to make sure yeah. I remember this. Um, the, the models are just. I think it's just that you can give a good case. Give a good case. Say what you've chosen. You can even say it was hard to choose. There is this hypothetical fact. There's that yes. one. You could always offer I, both. I just selected. I, I made the filter. I made the filter. I I, I, I did it via code. Ah. Uh huh. <laughs> I made the I made a code that selected columns with highest uh, correlations. Oh my God. Hello, Megan. How are you? Oh, nice glasses. <laughs> okay, I've got you on loudspeaker. Um, I haven't, Nathan's not around yet. I think what I could do is I could start chatting. Uh, let me just make sure that he's not emailing, like, I'm going to be there in a second. Uh, what, what's your schedule like? Is, like, what do you think? Should you, do you want to, like, jump in and do your bit first? Or should I talk about, what, what do you think is good here? Um, maybe we'll do that. I am just trying to quickly, I don't know how he's done this. Uh, oh, here we go. None. Okay. <laughs> and actually, uh, I don't think you even necessarily need to share screen. I've got the slides up. Perfect. Um, Thank you. And should I, I think, do I need to share screen for you to see them enough or can you see them enough? No, I, need I to have them. a laptop that I can follow along myself so don't worry about me thank you so much but yeah i don't think ours are sort of obviously they're complementary but they're not reliant on each other so i'm happy to get going and then as he arrives he can let's take over the more academic stuff okay perfect let's do that so i'm gonna um you'll tell me what slide number you want to go to but first just a very very quick uh introduction so this is megan whitehead megan whitehead i'm going to describe what you do and then you'll correct me for all the other extra stuff that you <laughs> okay. do but i've always understood megan to help students with kind of their career thoughts their career path their career planning supporting like conversations with students about what are the options, say I finish with a statistics degree, 
Uh, and I personally have some really interesting stories with like students who are really amazing in my class and then they got to the end and they graduated and they felt like I don't know what to do with my degree and then they went and they talked to Megan and like next thing they know they're getting like an amazing job with like Stats Canada or something like this. Um, so how else would you describe what you do Megan? Can you just tell me what slides you want me to put on the screen. Well, I start at slide six, um, and thank you for that very lovely introduction. So I think, yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, that's definitely a big part of um, what I hope to do. Uh, a lot of it is connecting students with resources. So, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that in the slides, but yeah, I mean, my, my role, I see it as, as a support for the students in the SATS department, undergraduate, who are looking for career conversations, career exploration, and yeah, it can be it can be everything from can you look at my resume and how does this look all the way up to I finished with a stats degree and I'm not entirely sure what I'm going to do with it. So um, that was really great. Thank you so much. Perfect. OK, I've got it on slide six and you just tell me whatever slide you want and I'll, I'll click around. OK, perfect. Well, thank you for having me. So a big part of uh, the department, I would say, if you do choose to join us in picking your post is an event that uh, we will put, we will have in uh, next semester. So certainly uh, come and join us for that event. Um, but we have a community. So looking at my slides, you know, there's office hours, there's, you know, an undergraduate SharePoint. Um, we're updating our website. Uh, you know, you probably know about debris uh explorer and planner that's not through us but certainly we do have uh supports in the department that can help you with that um course instructors tas so certainly you know we like to have a lot of people here to help you uh, i'll go to the next slide please which is more about what i do which is career support so um if you join the stats department uh, you could be joining as an actuarial student a statistical science student or a data science student um, we do have specialist uh, you know streams in all of those programs if you join the actuarial specialist program there is an internship component and we do have a professional experience course so we actually just wrapped that up um, that includes a lot of industry information connecting you with industry partners case competitions um, it's a really great program if you are interested in actuarial science um, the other specialist programs are all ASIP eligible and if you've not heard of ASIP you wouldn't be alone it's the arts uh, the Arts and Science Internship Program. And so it's relatively new. So it's out of the St. George campus and it's very much a co-op program. So um, you do have courses that you take that will help you again with sort of career preparation. Um, and then you do do uh, co-op terms or work terms. You can do as few as four and uh, for four, sorry, four months, one term for four months, all the way up to 20 months. Um, and so we definitely have uh, supports kind of within our, it would be me in our department, but we do connect you with the ASIP program. So that would be something you would join in year two or year three. Um, and as I said, it's all, uh, you know, just for the specialist programs at this time. The other thing that we do for career support is I send a weekly email. It goes out every Thursday and it has job postings, events, um, any sort of resources that we either know about or have created ourselves. We connect with our student groups. Um, we have a very active student group community and they also collaborate on events and activities with us and uh, we share their events too. So there's always something happening. Um, there's actually something happening in our department this Wednesday. So all the way up and even to the end of the year. Last week we did sort of a social event. So certainly always something going on. On the next slide, I can talk a little bit more about these events. So, um, it's a it's a growing department so there's a lot of folks here who are really interested in helping you do your best whether it is sort of academic or career and so we do have events that are you know very skill-based focused so we do programming our python workshops we did a ggplot one um we we're working with a student group next term to do a um you know, using analytics and statistics to uh, work in sports data. So trying to give you some options to sort of learn different ways to use your degree. Um, we do a lot of like, as I said, like some of the visualization. So, you know, ggplot, things like that. We do have case competitions. So we have sort of small, um, you know, 
ones that are a couple of hours. And then we have this massive data fest, which is a phenomenal event that occurs annually. So certainly, um, again, a lot of opportunities for you to grow your, your skill set. Um, we do mental health and wellness uh, sessions. So again, kind of the whole student. So it's not just about academics. It's really important that you, you know, have ways and outlets to, um, you know, help yourself feel well while you're, you know, kind of figuring out what you want to do. Um, one such event, which we're hoping to do again this year, is the therapy dogs. We did have therapy dogs come into our office, which was pretty much fun for everybody. Um, we just recently did a grad school information session. We will be doing more grad school support, I know, or hopefully you're not too concerned with that right now. Uh, but certainly as you get going, there might be some, you know, interest in furthering your degree. Um, we do a lot of panel events, a lot of alumni events. So we have, you know, people from industry come in and connect with you. And it's really important to share and learn stories about what other people have done mentioned sports analytics, I had to mention the therapy dogs, they really are fun. Um, and when we do sort of, we just did an exam distressor and we have sort of a Lunar New Year event coming up obviously in February. So again, really trying to give you a big picture of, um, you know, how to really engage with us. Um, on the next slide, I do talk a little bit about our other programming, which is student clubs and mentorships. So we have the STAT Student Union. They're actually um, incredibly engaged uh, this year. I've been really impressed with the folks that are in the executive and they have a lot of really great ideas and events that they're hoping to collaborate with us on and we'll be working with them. We also have the students in data science. They are the ones who are collaborating with us on the event on Wednesday. So sort of a little bit more of a focus there. The Axi Club, so they're also um, partners with us for the career fair that we host with them. Um, we have a lot of mentorships. So coming into, I know you've all, you know, hopefully enjoyed, but all participated in the STAT 130 mentorship program. Well, it doesn't end there. We do have a second year learning community. So once you are invited and you um, agree to come into the STATS program in second year, we do invite you to participate in a learning community. So there's a lot of really great information in um, academic career and just sort of making friends. Um, we have a Your Actuarial Buddy, so again, a program if you're curious about actuarial science, we help you to kind of connect with an upper year student who's doing that and can help kind of navigate that. Um, and then we have two alumni mentorship programs, so one for stats and one for actuarial science. And again, connecting you with somebody who's graduated usually within the last five to ten years and can help answer some questions, but certainly also, um, you know, get a sense of what's out there in the world beyond the university. So we really do, I want to emphasize the importance of, you know, not just the academic learning, not just the career skills building, but sort of a social network as well. It's a big university, so we want you to feel welcome. And then sort of in that welcoming uh, notion, I'll just very quickly on the last slide, um, flag who you have in the department. And as I said, we're growing constantly, but um, we do have a really great undergraduate department. Maybe you've already connected with, you know, Tim or Neha or one of those folks. If mentorship supports, we do have a dedicated mentorship coordinator. Uh, right now it's Miriam. She and Ivan are sort of sharing the role. Um, we also have um, me, <laughs> as I said, and so I'm more on the career support, but um, it, it sounds like maybe Nathan's there. Yes, Nathan has arrived. Are you yeah, all good? Okay, well, I'll, uh, I'll turn the floor over to him, but I'm, I'm here to answer any questions about all the information you just sort of spewed at everybody. I hope it wasn't too fast. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, wonderful. Perfect. Actually, there's a quick question here. Let's do a quick question now, real quick. The question was that you mentioned about the actuarial science program. Was that only for the specialists or is that for the majors uh, as well? The internship component, the internship component specifically. Yeah, so great question. So right now, the internship component is only a part of the specialist degree program. Um, I can go into all the reasons why, but the, the, the primary one is that it's a smaller group. Um, and because we require it as a, you must do an internship to graduate, we did not want to put that pressure on everybody. Um, but we do uh, allow ma major students 
in the actual program to attend the professional experience course. So we do have ACT 390 and that happens in the fall. You don't have to be a specialist to attend the course. So you'd still get the access to the case. You'd still get the access to sort of the industry um, professionals that we invite in. So you still get a lot of supports, but you would not be required to do the internship component. Um, and just to flag for anybody who's there is that you do need, if you are an international student or international fee paying student, you do require a work permit to work during the school year. So in the summer, have at it. You can do an internship, a work term. You don't need any sort of special permission. You just need your student visa. But if you do want to work during the fall or the winter term, you either need to be paying a domestic fee or you do need the work permit. And that again is why it's a smaller group in the actual specialist program and similarly in the specialist programs for the ASIP. Folks. So it seems like things can get very complicated and involved, but you just saw that there is a quite large staff to try to support these types of things. So these types of questions are wonderful and, and come get help about them. There's actually a follow up on this question, Megan. Uh The, the student who's asking these questions is, is very interested in actuarial science, and hey. they note that um, Econ 101 is not required but is recommended, and they're wondering, what does that mean? Would you advise that they take this course? Might that help their application or process into the actuarial program? No, it doesn't have any bearing on the actuarial specialist program. I think where the Econ comes from is that in actuarial science, a lot of um, the exams that you would end up taking. And again, I'm happy to like my email should hopefully be on here. I'm happy to meet with you to talk about this, like to answer all your questions. Um, but uh, there is a lot of like financial components. So a lot of actuarial scientists, you know, definitely go into the insurance industry, but many of them, because a lot of their work revolves around risk and risk management and risk mitigation, uh, a lot of them find success in financial groups. So the econ might give you some support or certainly some context in which as you do your other courses would just give you a good lens. So, um, I'll leave it at that because that is pretty specific, but I'm very happy to, I, we go up until the 20th. So, I mean, if you have some downtime during the exam period and you want to have a quick chat, I'm very happy to do that. Um, if these are answers you want before the break, but also next term, if you want to take a break from all of this information and come back to it fresh, I'm happy to meet with you then too. Yes, wonderful. Uh, the student says thank you, of course. Um, any other questions immediately for Megan? Okay, I think we're okay uh, then to move on. Um, so we just uh, flipped this around a little bit backwards because I wasn't clear uh, to Nathan like that we were a 9 a.m. class, so that, my apologies for that. Um, I do want to introduce, though, Nathan Tabak. If you don't know him, he's um, the associate chair in the statistics department, um, particularly the director for undergraduate programs uh, here in the stats department. Um, and I will say, uh, I, I, would, I would view Nathan as a personal mentor to me, guiding me through the system, through U of T and everything like this. So have a tremendous amount of uh, respect for Nathan. And I wanted to have Nathan come to um, tell you about everything that's going on kind of in the stats department these days. Uh, and I might ask some questions at the end, or maybe students will ask questions, but I'll just hand it off to you at this point. Okay, th thanks, Scott. So, um, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Nathan Tabak. I'm a professor in the, in the department and also the associate chair for undergraduate. And uh, what I've come to talk to you about today is uh, applying to statistics programs. So everybody's in their first year, right? Yeah. yeah, okay. So this is your first year, your first year at university, the end of the term. How's it feeling? They're very busy right now. You're very busy, yeah. Is it overwhelming or? A little bit, yeah, 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 no, for sure. I, uh, I have a deeper appreciation. My son actually, he's in second year and he just went through first year last year and I got a completely different perspective of what it means to be in first year. So um, hang in there, <laughs> that's all I can say. <laughs> Don't stress out too much, treat yourself, you know, have that Starbucks or whatever, you, whatever your treat is, watch some movies. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna talk about is statistics programs of study. Uh, so this course, 
uh, is one of the courses that you can take to apply to a statistics program study. But before I get to that, um, I'm just going to talk about a little kind of case study. Um, there, there's this fellow, Abraham Wald, and uh, he was, he's a pretty famous statistician. Anybody ever heard of him? No, I, I wouldn't expect. Maybe second year, third year, or something like that. Anyways, uh, he was part of this group uh, in, uh, around World War II, doing you know, military research stuff in the States. And uh, like a lot of statisticians were at the time, so he wasn't unique in that respect. And they asked him a question. They said, OK, Abraham Wald and, and the group of Abraham Wald. Um, they were asked, um, where should they place armor on these planes that were coming back over, um, from bombing runs over Europe? So he said, well, you know what? Why don't you plot the bullet holes as they're coming back on the planes. So those are all the red dots on the plane. And they were saying, so again, like the question is, where do you put the extra armor? The data is biased. So we put the extra armor on the engines and on all the places where we don't have the dots. Because mm. those planes never return. Mm. Mm. Very good. So did, you, did anybody hear what he said? Yeah. What? Right, right. And so, um, so that's, that's basically it. And, um, but, but why? What led him to that reasoning? Because the data was biased. The data is biased, but why is the, what is the bias here? The bias is the planes that do survive are the ones that they're actually looking at. So all the bullet holes that they find on those planes are the ones that they were able to plot on them but they don't have the entirety of the data, which was also the planes that did not end up coming back to, to the land. So those are all the planes that were eventually destroyed. That, that's right, yeah. So he's saying, basically, you didn't get a chance to see the planes that were destroyed. So what he reasoned is that you should put the bullet holes on the places where, um, where there weren't a lot of bullet holes, even though he couldn't see them. So why do I bring up this example? It's something called survivorship bias. Very good, thank you. <laughs> um, and it's the idea when a successful subgroup is mistaken for the entire group, just, just like you said and just like you indicated up there. Um, and it comes from this error in thinking. And so this is a great example of statistical reasoning. And hopefully you're doing some of that in this course. I think you are. <laughs> Actually, I'll jump in and say yeah. uh, this is highly relevant for the final. I did ask a Oh, okay. I didn't even know that. No, no, but oh. I asked it on the midterm, and the students did okay. So they get one more shot at this concept on the final. Yeah. You know, it actually comes up all the time. So when you're seeing data, um, the, the point here, and the reason that I put up this example, is so that you have some sort of way of critically thinking about it. Because I'm quite confident, as most of you in this room go on to do whatever you're going to study, you will come across data. Whether you study psychology or political science or go into medicine or go into tech, become a computer scientist, become a machine learning researcher, you will see data. And it's really important to be able to critically think about it. Even if you do know nothing beyond that, even if you're just you know, looking at news and there's data sources quoted all the time, it's a really good idea to um, be understand how to like think about it critically. You know, I mean, another example of this that's that kind of gets a little bit of play is when um, uh, you know talk, talking about um, you know all these successful startups. So why would I bring up successful startups? So for example, Mark Zuckerberg dropped out of university. He built Facebook in his dorm room at Harvard, and you know there's another story. You know, Larry Page and Sergey Brin. You know, they developed Google. You know, they dropped out of Stanford. So what's the problem in looking at just those people? Because those are just the 
successful startups? Those are just the successful startups. Again, so again, like another idea of survivor bias, survivorship bias. So, um, so I bring this up. So why study statistics or data science? Um, so here are, my, here are some things that I thought about yesterday. It's an interesting subject. I think it's interesting. I think Scott thinks it's interesting. <laughs> um, these methods are used everywhere. Um, medicine, political science, banking finance, actuarial science. It's really big in actuarial science now. Um, environmental science, humanitarian aid, technology, like, you know, all your devices, you know, this is, these are basically data collection devices. Um, statistical literacy, so being able to understand statistical methods, and data acumen, so knowing how to treat a data set well and appropriately, um, are really important for just, I think, modern critical thinking. Um, and then my last reason is, you know, and maybe this is, should be some people's first reason, is there's lots and lots of career opportunities. I could give you all kinds of statistics, how st statisticians and data scientists are in need, but I don't know, you can go look that up yourself. Okay, so after taking this course, um, you can apply to the specialist in statistics. There's two, we have two flavors of it. One is a theory and methods one and one is a um, methods and practice one. The methods and practice one is a little bit more applied, a lot more applied, and then the theory and methods one as well, it's more theoretical. Um, there's the data science specialist, which is a joint program with computer science. And the, uh, the neat thing about that program is that it's really, um, it's about half the courses are computer science, half the courses are statistics, and then there's these integrative courses where um, you learn very practical data science skills. There's the statistics major, which is you know, a lighter um, statistics program. And then there's the minor, which um, is open enrollment. So um, the first ones um, require an application. And so this course, after your first year, you could apply. This and um, either Math 135 and 136, or if you're taking Math 137, or, or 157. The statistics minor, um, if you just, if you want to do another specialist or a major, then you can just add the statistics minor at any point. So maybe I'll just start, and then of course the academic calendar has all kinds of information, like all, all the nitty gritty about what the completion requirements are, et cetera. So that's coming up this spring uh, when you can enroll. So maybe I'll just stop there and just, does anybody have any questions about applying to these programs? I, yeah, back there. Huh? How exactly do you apply? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I've never applied, so I don't really know. <laughs> um, I think it's on Acorn. Is it, do you use Acorn? Yes. Okay, good. I don't use Acorn, but if you use Acorn, that's good. Yeah, I think it's through Acorn. One more game. Yeah. Uh, what is the difference between the first two and the third? So what's the difference between the first two? The methods and practice, the theory and methods, and the data science specialist. So the methods and practice one is, um, it, it's much more applied. So it's applied statistics. So it's learning how to use statistical methods um, and apply them to different areas. And that the, en the end of that program caps off with a course um, where you, um, it's a communication, consultation, and collaboration course. Um, and the other thing I should say about um, those two, actually all those three, is that they're, um, they're eligible for the Arts and Science Internship Program. So you can do an internship as part of those. Um, the second one, the Theory and Methods, is more theoretical. So uh, um, the courses that you would take are more th theory-based, so more, a little bit more mathematical. And then the Data Science Specialist, um, it's different in the sense that it's um, half roughly half computer science courses, half statistics courses, and then these integrative data science courses. They're, they have a course called, called JSC, for Joint Statistics Computer Science. I don't know, I hope that answers your question. Yeah? Would we be dealing with R or Python in data science? So uh, the question is, would you be dealing with R or Python in data science? Any guesses? 
Shout it out. Python. Python. R. Both. R. What? Both. 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 Yes, both and more. You'll be dealing with more. Lots of programming languages. Yeah. So the important thing about programming languages is not the actual flavor of language. It's that you understand the concepts behind uh, what's going on with the computer and what the computer is doing. So um, I suspect that in a decade, this is my prediction, there'll be something else other than R or Python. And you will have to learn that if you stay in this field. And hopefully you have a firm basis in programming uh, so that you can move on and learn that. Any other questions? I, and I think if you did, for example, the data science specialist, there's all sorts of computer science courses in C. They'll use C, they'll use C++, they'll use Java. Um, maybe if you take a hardware course, they'll use something called Verilog. I don't know. Other questions about this? I'm, I'm very happy to answer them after. OK. Uh, Community. I think Megan covered all this stuff. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So that that's my uh, that's my spiel. Nice. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, You're Nathan. Um, so my feeling to bring Megan and Nathan in here today, and thank you so much, Megan. No problem. I'll leave you all to your class. I wish you all the very best with uh, the upcoming assessments and the well-deserved winter break. So hopefully we'll see you in our department next year. Take care, everybody. Absolutely. Bye, Megan. Bye, Megan. Um, I know you, the push is still here, um, but they have, they've made a lot of progress. I don't mean to just toot my cap, but we've covered a lot of material. I think many students have gone from not much experience to lots and lots of experience. Um, and you are coming up on kind of the time where you'll be thinking about these types of things. Um, again, like my intention here is to show you that the department is very interested in having conversations with you and wants to be very supportive with you. Um, I think we're very approachable. I want you to know we're very approachable. Uh, and available. Um, it's not exactly a sales pitch because I want you guys to do exactly what you want to do, but it might be an option and hopefully your experience through this class, the progress that you've had through this class uh, suggests to you that you might want to learn more in this area. Um, I only have a few little minutes here, but let me very quickly, we do have a few important things that we should do. Um, let, me, let me see. So. Maybe, maybe most important is to talk about the final very quickly. No, I said final, but what I really meant was the course project. That's on Thursday. So um, I will be opening up Quirkus for you guys to submit um, your slides. You're getting evaluated for approximately like 23 slides. Let me jump on to uh, this announcement. Oh my goodness, I have too many things up here. Where's my stuffs? Here we go. Um, I want to draw your attention. I, I kind of already did. Um, but let me go back to my announcement about the course project to try to just describe a little bit more. So that's the space in the medical science uh, lobby that we'll be in. Um, there'll be these blue poster boards everywhere. I know that's like a little bit small. Uh, but that's quite representative of what this is like. So you're making a slide deck. Um, and once again, that's a little ghetto in the way that we're doing it, where you're working in um, Jupyter slides, in Jupyter templates, slide templates, and because I want you to be using Markdown and having some experience with Markdown. But then I think if you just hit print, it's not going to be able to print out one slide per page. So you need to screen capture and then put these in a, a PowerPoint. And I know that's very ghetto, but honestly, that's the easiest way to do this. So that at the end of the day, you have a stack of 23 sheets of paper or thereabouts. You can't really have 24. You can't have 25 for sure. Maybe you can have a, a little bit less. And you'll put them up on the poster boards just like this. Um, you want to have a whole kind of standalone presentation. You want to introduce 
in generality what the project is, you want to introduce the different methods and considerations and analyses that you're doing, and then kind of your findings. So kind of like, you know, the whole thing. So use your slides judici judiciously, the 23 slides and so on. Um, there's a rubric. Hopefully you've seen the rubric in the course uh, project slides. So that's what the TAs are going to have, and then they're going to have sheets. TAs are going to come by and listen to you for approximately 12 minutes. Um, since I've drawn your attention to this, everything that I know about how the course project is going to happen is actually in here. So you might say I don't know too much about how the course project is going to happen, but at least it's very, very simple. Like, take a look at this if you haven't had a look at this. Your presentations are going to be about 12 minutes. If you go a little bit, a couple minutes long, that's probably okay. But you should be presenting for about 12 minutes, and then the TAs will have questions for you for about three minutes. Um, all of your group members should be presenting. Hopefully the group dynamics are, are positive and there's different contributions from different group members that allows for a very natural kind of uh, assignments of kind of who's, who's doing what. Um, as you know, only three groups are being selected for the um, Sandbox Pilot Showcase presentations. I do actually now have in the list of like the TAs and the teams. So the teams were interested and the TAs are willing to recommend this is a strong team. So on Tuesday, I'll be looking over this and we'll be selecting the three teams which we'll be presenting. Now that presentation, for you guys, you're the 9 to 11 slot on Thursday. Um, if you need to change to the 1 to 3 print slot, let me and all your teammates know. Send an email to the STAT 130 uh, email address. Everybody has to say, yes, yes, I agree to switch. But most people aren't going to be switching. So you'll be in the 9 to 11 slot. And uh, at 11.30, just after this, I got to run and have the meeting to finalize exactly the logistics. So you'll very soon have an email, probably tomorrow, a course announcement from me about actually like when you arrive, the logistics of arriving, how you sign in, and all this. But you'll have all the information that will be in some sort of um, Quirkus announcement just like this, and you'll get that tomorrow. But at this point, I think you'll, you'll have enough. You know, it's about 23 slides. And I brought up the sandbox pilot just to say that um, you can expect the same format essentially if you're selected as one of these three kind of like teams representing our class, except you wouldn't be printing out your slides. This is kind of like the printer version of giving a slide talk, right? Like really what you're doing is you have slides and you're flipping through slides, but to facilitate the in-person presentation of this, you're putting them up in this kind of like grid pattern on these. If you were presenting at the Sandbox no, 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 uh, uh, Showcase, Sandbox Showcase, um, then you'd be like flipping and clicking through slides. But honestly, I don't see there being a tremendous difference. Uh, I mean, maybe you think that's a big difference, but as far as like what you build and what you make for your presentation and your slides, it's not so different if you're doing the showcase or, or if you're doing this. Okay, so I think I'm happy with that on logistics for the course project. So it's Thursday, hopefully you're in a good position and you don't need to cram rush too much at the end, but you've got a few more days to finish things up there. I'll take a few questions if there are any, is there anything that's like, should obviously be asked? Yeah. So, uh, do we need to make screenshots of like, the whole thing, or can we select like particular parts that we screenshot, like for example, just the graph? Or, uh, yeah, I think if you wanted to put a graph like as a full slide and you thought that was the right way to present that information, I think that's totally okay. Um, so the exercise is wanting you to play with Markdown and, ex and get some experience with that. But in the end, it is a slide deck with the presentation. You want it to look good. You want it to design it well. So the Markdown too doesn't have to be like, okay, so we want it to be a presentation. So the Markdown shouldn't be very detailed, just rough, rough, rough points, right? Yeah, to me, I mean, I really do like Markdown for presentations. You can make outlines. You can kind of make your points. You can emphasize things. So as far as like formatting tools, I think Markdown is appropriate for making slides, but you decide your presentation style, your format, you know, your aesthetic. So again, I would check to the rubric. Uh, I actually don't remember like how many points on the rubric are having to do with particular Markdown items. I think if I remember right, there's a few points that I, I am looking to see that you have some mastery over Markdown and can use it. There were a lot of questions, a lot of hands, so we're going to keep going. This is the hand I see right now. Yes. It's because that's six by four grid, that's what you can put on there. So 24 would be maximum, but
but I imagine we're going to use one of those spaces to be like, this is poster 10, then people arrive and go to poster 10. So it's like really like you can't have more than 23. You could have less and that would be quite fine if you're making your points in less slides, but it's actually like a physical limitation space. I'm going to, I see all the hands, I'm going to keep trying, yes. Yes, I have the names of the teams from the TAs, and so now I'm going to reach out to the teams, say, give me what you have, and evaluate my selection based on that. So you'll know by Tuesday or, or Wednesday at the very latest whether or not the team was selected. I saw a hand here. Yes. So will you be printing our slides when we submit them, or do we print them ourselves? You need to print them. Yes. Great question. Yep, you come with your slides in hand. Now, we'll have little stickies for you, and then you'll, you'll have set up. So you'll have to, like, put them up on the board like that. Oh, formal wear is not required, but um, it, it, uh, it, sure, it sure can go a long way to look professional, honestly. You know, like, it's like food. Like, if food is plated well, it tastes better. That's like, an, on average, that's true. So, you know, if you come, if your team comes, like, looking, like, sharp, like you mean business, this actually can help a little bit, quite honestly. Um, I saw this hand's been very patient. Yes? What type of questions will TA ask? TA, it's going to, I mean, that, that's a... Uh, I don't know what to call this, like it's a, it's a luck of the draw, you know, the TA, you'll get one TA, not necessarily your TA, because it depends what TAs are available, and there's like 10 groups presenting kind of in a simultaneous way, so someone will show up and they'll be like, hey, I'm here to listen, you'll give the talk, and they're going to really do their best to understand what you're doing, and then ask a critical question, I don't mean a negative question, I mean an insightful kind of question, it just really depends, that's now an interpersonal dynamic and so on, so I, I think they would, you know, they'll be coached or, or kind of directed to try to push to, 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 to pressure test your knowledge a little bit like that. Would it be about the code or like... No, I really don't think it would be about code. I think it would be much more conceptual. It would be much more about what is the intentionality, uh, like what do you, what, what do you, what's your big takeaways here? What about this concern? Have you thought about this? So I don't know. I can't be more specific than that. And like this is a part, I mean there's many parts of a project where it's quote unquote not fair. Even group, group dynamics are not fair. From project to project, from team to team, it's not fair. I mean it's going to be a different experience for different people. And this is part of that. So you know, you just want to be as engaging, as positive as possible. Uh, and you know, I suppose you know, if you are looking really sharp and you do impress the TAs and you give a good presentation, I imagine they're going to be kind of on a, on a nice type of attitude, right? Kind of amenable to be playful in their questions and kind of have fun with their questions. So, but we'll just see. It, it's just kind of meant to see kind of really just, a, I said pressure test, but like I also mean like just kind of a sanity check. Like can the, can the team have a conversation about what they've done? Another great question. Another hand up, please. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's logistics. I'll give you an email Tuesday, like uh, ho hopefully Tuesday. I'm going to the meeting right after class here. We'll finalize what logistics are. Yeah, yeah. L let me comment on this. So, like, it's like it's about a 12-minute presentation and about three minutes QA, Q and A. So you have about 15 minutes, and then the TAs have an additional like five minutes after that, which is why I say you could go a little long, but we don't want to just continually go long. The TAs need to have time to look at the rubric and mark the presentations that they've just seen. This means we're in blocks of 20 minutes, essentially. Um, so we're either, we're gonna either be more casual with teams kind of arrive, and you might have to wait while we find a group for you, or we'll be in like specific 20-minute uh, intervals, and we'll say, okay, you're coming at 1.40, I guess you wouldn't come at 1.40, you're coming at 9.40, uh, and then you'd wanna get there early to set up. Uh, and probably, you know, 15 minutes early is probably sufficient. No, you'll be setting up, you'll be like building up and tearing down. There'll be like a lot of commotion. So you'll set up, you'll present, and then you'll take it down right away. Uh, yes, exactly. So like if you were starting right at 9 a.m., you would need to come a little bit early. You'd come at 8.30 or 8.45, something like that. Yep. Any more questions? These are great questions. Okay, I see no more hands up for this, which is good. Once again, this is the Quirkus announcement, which knows everything that I know. Um, and you'll be getting a new Quirkus announcement with logistics that are like to this question, like, okay, so but like, when does my group arrive and all this? So more details as soon as I finalize those at 11.30. How much time do I have to tell you about the... I have three minutes, and it's okay. A quick question, yes. Okay. Uh, do we have to print the pages ourselves? Yes, you need to print. Come, come with the pages, uh, ready to put them up on the board. So 
I, I think what I want to say about the um, final exam is you will do a lot better on the material after the midterm if you've done well in your course project. I think the questions that I ask about regression, multivariate regression, I think they really, it's like if you understood what's happening in the course project well and you're doing this model and this analysis well, you should be quite comfortable with the regression questions uh, that I'm asking on the final. Um, the stuff that Steve talked about, I jumped in and I said, these points are relevant, so there's some kind of ethics thing. Actually, I did send out an announcement detailing this. Let me go ahead and put that up on the screen very quickly. Um, and actually, as I put this up here, I'll again say, these are kind of my final thoughts on what the final exam is. Um, so I, I probably don't have time to like go through this again, but you guys can read so you can look at this. But um, let me say that about, because the final exam is comprehensive, about 60% of the topics on the final exam or the points on the final exam are very heavily towards the midterm. Like I cut in on Nathan and said survivor bias is something that's relevant. So I'll be asking a survivor bias question again. Um, and you guys will remember I carefully, thoroughly reviewed the midterm and had comments about the, the general performance of the class and so on. And that was really meant as learning feedback for you guys. So reviewing that carefully will go a long way to helping you for a large portion of the final exam, like 60% about of the points on the final exam. Um, and then of course there's kind of classification stuff. That would be the conversation that I had last class. But I think I think that's honestly, like, if we had more time, maybe there's more to say. But these are, that's the update on these things. You're almost there. You're almost done. So push through, get the final project done. Then you're going to have a breather. Final exam's not until the 19th, so you'll have some time.